There's an old Cherokee parable wherein a father tells his son that there are two wolves living inside each of us. One is good, he is strong, courageous, noble, generous, and kind. He protects his pack and all that is theirs with his life. The other is evil, being crude, malicious, greedy, and spiteful. He lives to devour all that are weaker than himself for no other reason than to vacuously prove his superior power. The son, quite naturally, asks which wolf is stronger, to which the father wisely responds, whichever one you feed. Now, I trust my regular viewers to be cultured enough to already have some basic familiarity with the concept of the yin-yang, the eternal dance, light and dark, black and white, hot and cold, start and end, good and evil, etc., and so on. These dyadic constants all share one thing in common. They are codependent, meaning that neither can exist, let alone function, without the opposed twin, and thus cannot be separated, just as the two sides of a coin cannot exist independently. Why am I telling you this? Well, after reading and thoroughly contemplating the comments on my videos on how to spot, argue with, and debate an ideologue, I have come to the realization that therein I had made a grave philosophical error. Many people rightly pointed out how I seem to paint all religions everywhere throughout all of history with the same monochromatic brush of irrationality and ideological zealotry. This was not my intent, nor was it to claim that either religion, ideology, philosophy, or science are inherently superior or inferior to each other, as that would be to fall victim to the one best way fallacy, as discussed in my video Four Fallacies of Authoritarianism. And by not making that distinction abundantly clear, I have violated my first channel rule of not to speak authoritatively or elsewise present myself, implicitly or explicitly, as an authority on subjects about which I am not. And for that, I humbly apologize. But I hope you'll allow me to make up for my human deficiency now by explaining how not only are the above four modes of human thought far from mutually exclusive, but in fact most often come as an integrally nested package which I have mocked up for you in this diagram. Also, just so we're all clear on this too, I chose the words I did, as well as the definitions I constructed for each, not for strict classification's sake, but as a form of conceptual shorthand. In other words, I figured more people would understand where I was going without me having to spell it out in so much esoteric jargon, which would not only have made the videos needlessly long and verbose, but also prohibitively dense and technical for the average person to get to grips with. So in the interest of accessibility and brevity, I molded the existing terms into what I needed for my presentation. I in no way meant to overrule the existing terms or the significance thereof. And one last thing, as long as I've got my corrections pen out, I'd like to quickly address the massive pink elephant in the room. Atheism. Atheism is a negative statement of belief. A belief, as mentioned in my How to Spot an Ideologue video, is a positive conviction of something's validity or truth. To say you don't believe something is equivalent to saying that you're not convinced. To call yourself an atheist, therefore, is to say no more or less than you are not convinced any actual deity actually exists in any tangible capacity within objective reality. And thus an atheist, in and of that characteristic alone, has no more expressed or asserted a positive conviction or worldview than someone who claims to be skeptical of Bigfoot, fairies, or Santa Claus. And this is why there is, in the most technical sense, no such thing as an atheistic religion. You cannot worship, insofar as I understand the term, the absence of something. You cannot submit to an empty void while also still drawing breath. Now, with all that finally said and done, I've mentioned before that I am, and I'll say that I still remain neither an advocate for religion, either as a whole or any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor an avid detractor. I am simply utterly opposed to any person or group, religious or secular, who touts their brand of ideological mysticism as the absolute truth. The problem I thus recognize with trying to build a rational house off of a human blueprint is that ideas of any sort are just mental tools, and like any other kind of tool, they exist only insofar as they play a specific role in achieving a particular result. This is why I draw the line between ideology and religion defined as the pursuit of an ideal world and an ideal personal state of being, respectively, even though they almost never appear outside of each other's company. I reason that the simple fact that the two distinct terms exist means that they must serve two functionally distinct purposes, and I stand by this proposal. But also just like a hammer or a shovel, any kind of mental action, 
rational or otherwise or instrument, can as easily be and has been put to the task of destruction as creation. Of course, this is all elementary-grade metaphysical geometry, so I have no doubt you already knew as much. So why then am I bringing it up? Because, as Aristotle correctly taught, virtue is the middle point between two extremes. Not too much, nor too little. An excess of light is just as blinding as absolute darkness. You need that middle spectrum of gray in order to truthfully orient yourself in the world and so wisely propel yourself through life. The problem is, the human mind does not tend to cope well with ambiguity or paradoxes. We like things to be simple and straightforward. The average simple sheep just isn't motivated by abstract principles. They need concrete directions, something or someone telling them, go here, now there, do this, do that. And it's not just humans, or even life in general for that matter. All of nature is, at its root, simple and compulsory. Nothing moves without an external impetus, per Isaac Newton's first law of motion. Nothing happens without a direct, localized cause. And this doesn't stop being the case for complex systems. It only becomes harder to locate the initial impetus. This is why humans need religion and ideology far more than they need philosophy and science. Without gravity constantly accelerating us towards the earth, we would have no concept of up or down. Without the concept of fear or hunger or thirst, sans the constant needs to pursue sustenance and flee predation, our bodies would have remained locked within the primitive design patterns of the Precambrian microbes. Just so, when we have no concept of morality, no idea of how our world should and should not be, what behaviors we should and should not tolerate, our society will cease to be a cohesive, intelligent body. It will devolve into a giant, global petri dish of semi-sentient bacteria. But having said all of that, I also recognize that not all tools are created equal. To a carpenter, a saw is what a hammer is to a blacksmith, or a wrench is to the plumber, and so on and so forth. And by that same coin, the more versatile the tool, the more diverse its range of functional utility, the more people will want to possess it. Though, ironically, this actually has an inverse effect on its value within a social context, as ideas that are not strictly needed for survival are often coveted more, and thus valued more highly, than ones of a purely utilitarian nature. Why? Because in nature, having more than you need to survive is a rare and exotic luxury, and, as said, excess wealth implies an excess of strength and cunning on the part of whoever can both get and keep it. It makes them worthy of elevated social status and the reproductive access that goes with that. This is why scholars and artists occupy a higher social niche than farmers or builders, even though the latter two groups are literally the whole reason we even have a society in the first place, the former having the luxury of excess time and energy to cultivate non-essential knowledge and skills, i.e., they have the luxury of learning things that don't directly impact their survival. This is also why, in our modern world, the upper classes shun and despise the use or possession of guns, because they themselves don't need them, what with their living under armed guard 24-7. All of that babble is to say that religion, which I will go forward calling inspiration, and ideology, which I'll now call aspiration, are essential, whereas philosophy and science are more surplus to requirements from a societal maintenance standpoint. I don't need to understand how leverage works, or have the ability to calculate impact forces to know whether a hammer or a wrench is more applicable to a given problem. Now, don't misinterpret my wording here. I haven't just gone and done an about-face, calling reason and science an accessory to religion's feature core, just because a few people had some choice words for me in the comments. Make no mistake, I still revere the practices of objective research and deductive thinking as wholly as I've ever done. All that's changed is that I have a newfound appreciation for the integral role of the subjective disciplines in our lives. Though I suppose I've always known this on some level. I'm a creator after all. My point is that each of these four systems of thought is a powerful asset in its own way and an indispensable tool in its own right. But just like the four classical elements or the four cardinal directions, none can stand alone in a vacuum, for each is defined, and indeed manifested, by its cerebral cousins. Which brings me to the quaternary diagram you've been seeing on screen for the last several minutes, which I'm sure you all either have read or are perfectly capable of pausing and reading on your own time, so I won't insult your intelligence by narrating it to you. To avoid stumbling into the same web of misinterpretation as before, I'll be calling the collective upper hemisphere the locomotors going forward, both because they are our main source of motivation, and thus locomotion, and because everything sounds more important when you say it in Latin. 
and I'll call the lower half the Homo Dynamos, as they are what make the human race such nigh-infinitely adaptive animals. And here, at long last, is where we come to the real premise of this video. How can we, both as a society and as individuals, avail ourselves of the virtues of all without falling prey to any of their excessive or regressive vices? Or, in simpler words, how can we know, objectively, that we've strayed too far in or from any direction? Thankfully, the answer is elementary. Whenever your application of any one starts to contradict the virtues of any other, you'll know you've gone off kilter. Of course, the next most obvious question some of you will have is where exactly faith fits into this new paradigm. Well, remember that, in this model, religion is a function of desire, not belief, and therefore faith, in its context, is also not a statement of conviction about the objective truth of an abstract ideal or principle, but of dedication to pursuit within reason. Semper Fidelis, ever faithful. I don't have to believe that Aragorn or Luke Skywalker or Superman are real people to be inspired by their exceptional examples. See my other video, Why Fantasy Makes a Good Religion, for more of my thoughts on that front. Link will be below for your convenience. And lastly, I should have mentioned this before, but it seems like an appropriate final point. Religiosity, which is the ratio of ego invested in a given idea or system, is the true enemy of all, not religion itself. In other words, when constructed thoughtfully, it's not religion that radicalizes people. It's people who radicalize their religion by injecting an unhealthy amount of their own identity in it. And this is true for other spaces too, not just religious or political. I'm sure we've all seen that one insufferable person attempt to gatekeep a hobby space or that ass clown who gets way too into a game for anyone's good, including their own. Now I could probably easily expand this script another three or four pages, but I think I've already covered more than enough ground for right now. So yeah, like, subscribe, comment, and all the other standard YouTube stuff. Check out my Rumble, Odyssey, and Locals accounts. Buy my books, etc. and so on. And until next we meet, stay safe, stay sane, and don't stare too long into that abyss. Peace be upon you.